Through him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The word of God I would lay on your hearts today comes to us from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. We read, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of, out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So far, God's holy word. Dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed, when we still lived in the basement downstairs, we got to know quite a few of our neighbors in our little block here in Madison Heights. Last summer, there was a couple that moved in across the street, an Indian couple, right over here. And uh, they had a little baby, a few months older than our daughter. So we got to know them pretty well and became pretty fast friends. One day, I was outside talking with Naveen, the husband, when he mentioned that he had never been in a church before. I said, well, there's no time like the present. So I brought him in here and I gave him a little tour of our building. And as we entered through those double doors back there, he stopped very abruptly and said, wait, don't we need to take our shoes off? I think I chuckled a little bit and said, no, it's fine. We don't do that. But it stuck with me even to this day. And many cultures and religions recognize the importance of taking our shoes off, especially when we come onto holy ground. Today, as we observe the transfiguration of Jesus, we also look here to God's word this morning, where the angel of the Lord said to Moses, Do not come near. Take off your sandals, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And so to the disciples, Peter, James, and John, tasted a similar experience when Jesus was transfigured or transformed before them, when Moses and Elijah appeared on that mountain, as we read in our gospel lesson earlier. So, what does a burning bush have to do with Transfiguration Sunday? What does it have to do to you? 
What does it have to do with the importance of the great I am God and the fact that he cares for you and listens to you? And what does it mean to stand in the presence of that holy God? These are all questions that we seek to answer today with the help of the Spirit as we consider the theme, You Stand on Holy Ground. The Lord knows and calls you. The Lord plans for and delivers you. The Lord hears and empowers you. There was an American author by the name of Albert Hubbard who once said, A friend is someone who knows everything about you and still loves you. There's definitely some truth to that, isn't there? And no one knows us better than the Lord. And the Lord certainly knew Moses pretty well. At the time of our text, Moses was well past his prime. He was very aware of that fact. By the time God appeared to him in the burning bush, it had been 80 years since Moses was born a slave in Egypt, along with the rest of the Israelites. 80 years since Pharaoh had very famously commanded that all the infant Hebrew males should be killed so that the Israelites wouldn't become too powerful and rebel against him. 80 years since Moses' mother had woven that basket together and patched it with tar so that she could place him in it in the Nile River where he was found by Pharaoh's daughter and raised as an adopted son in Pharaoh's house. And since then, it had been 40 years since a brash, young-ish Moses had killed an Egyptian taskmaster in cold blood. He murdered him, and he had to flee for his life. By the time God appeared to him in the burning bush, Moses had been working as a shepherd for his father-in-law for 40 years. We know that he was married. He had at least two sons. He probably had grandchildren. He very likely had great-grandchildren by this time. And God knew all this. God knew about his survival as an infant in Egypt, in Egypt. He knew because he had been the one who planned it. But he also knew all about Moses' dark past, that murder, which no doubt still haunted him to that day. He knew about Moses' sin. He knew who he was inside and out, down to his very bones. Just like he also knows about us and our sin deep down to our very bones. God knows you. That can be a very comforting thing at times. It can also be a very terrifying thing at times if we're honest with ourselves. Psalm 103 verse 14 says, He knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. He remembers that a lot better than we do, doesn't he? There's nothing quite like God's all-knowing holiness to remind a person of his sinful condition. And Moses became very aware of this in our text today, very aware of his sin when God said, Do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And what was Moses' reaction? He hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Holy ground is not a very good place for an unholy person to be standing. Think again of those three disciples from our gospel reading. When they saw the holy glory of Jesus transfigured before them and heard the Father's voice thundering down from heaven like we just sang about in our last hymn, what was their reaction? They fell on their faces and were terrified. So how was Moses able to stand before that burning bush? How were the disciples able to get up and stand on the Mount of Transfiguration? How are we able to stand before Holy God? How are we able to come here to church this morning and worship Him and praise Him with our songs and pray to Him and do all the things that we do at church when we know just how unclean and how unholy and how unworthy we are? Well, in our gospel reading, after that transfiguration was over, Jesus went and told Peter and James and John, Rise, have no fear. He called them to their feet. And in our text, we're told that the I am God, the burning bush, was the one who took action, not Moses. It was he who reached out and called him and commanded him to take off his shoes. 
It was he who called him to the bush by name. Moses, Moses, come here. The Lord lovingly calls his children despite our unholiness. Moses was not qualified to do what God was calling him to do. He was a failed leader. Forty years earlier, he failed. He was old, 80 years old now. He was a shepherd. He was not a commander. He was no leader of men. But the Lord does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. The Lord does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And that goes for us too, thankfully. You too have been called, as we read in Isaiah 43. The Lord declares, I have redeemed you. Fear not. I have called you by name. You are mine. You have been called to turn in repentance from your unholiness and turn to God for forgiveness. It is your call from your Savior Jesus, who much like he said to the disciples, he says to you, Rise and don't be afraid. Your sins are forgiven. Your call as God's forgiven child qualifies you to come to him, qualifies you to stand on the holy ground of his justice and mercy. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, we read that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. So through Christ's work of redemption and by your call to faith, which the Holy Spirit has reached out to you with, God knows you. And that's not scary. That's comforting. God knows you not as the sinner that you are, but as the saint that he declares you to be. Because of God's declaration of justification on account of the substitutionary payment of Jesus, you do stand on holy ground. He welcomes you here, and he welcomes you into his family. Not only does the Lord know you and call you, he also plans for and delivers you. I want you to think for a moment about the largest event that you've ever planned. Go ahead, take a second. Maybe it was a birthday or graduation party. Those are pretty big events. It takes a lot of work, doesn't it? How about a wedding or a festival? A lot of planning. How about a family reunion or a work conference? If I had to ask you to describe what that experience was like in one word, what would you say? How about stressful? Mighty stressful doing that kind of planning, isn't it? There's always another crisis to be solved, another disaster to avoid, another last-minute adjustment. Make sure everything turns out just right. Well, God told Moses in verses 7 and 8, he said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Later in Exodus, we read that there were 600,000 men plus women and children, Hebrews, who were living in Egypt. So biblical scholars will put that at roughly around 2.4 million people. Can you imagine what it would be like to plan to move 2.4 million people? It's such a massive and immense event that was taking place here. You need food. You need water. You need housing. You need toilets. You need a legal system. You need a judicial system. You need leadership. You need leadership for your leadership. This kind of thing just doesn't happen overnight where people just get up, 2.4 million people, and walk away. It would take years and years of intense, detailed planning to make this work in preparation. And Moses had at least some kind of sense of that because he says in our text today, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I that I should bring the children of Egypt, the children of Israel, out of Egypt? It's a pretty good question, isn't it? Who was he? Who was he to undertake such a massive, earth-shaking event and plan that, something like the Exodus? Well, God had a pretty easy answer for that. He says in verse 12, I will be with you. And it's that simple. The Lord always has a plan, and he always delivers his children. Unlike human planners, God doesn't have to scramble around at the last second to make sure that all the details are 
just how he needs them. There are no last second crises or disasters to solve or avoid. This is the I am God. His plans are perfect and the execution of his plans are perfect. He knew exactly what the plan was. He knew exactly what it was going to take to get Pharaoh to release his people. He knew exactly how long it was going to take. And he knew that the Israelites would complain and rebel for a long time to come. Because he knows and he plans for everything. And in the Lord's plans, there are no surprises, no last minute adjustments. That goes for Moses and Israel, and that goes for you too. That beloved verse, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for peace and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. The Lord has a plan. And he always delivers on his plan. So when we encounter crises and disasters in our lives, remember, they're not disasters to the great I Am God. Crises and disasters in our lives are simply more opportunities for God to deliver you, to show his glory to you so that we can glorify him in return. We know that the greatest disaster which the world ever faced was the eternal destruction of all mankind on account of our sins. And did God have a plan? Of course he did. It was immediate, wasn't it? Right after the fall into sin, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, God delivered his first gospel promise to send his son to crush the power of the devil. It was always the plan to send Jesus. Moses knew that plan. He was very much aware of it. And he even got to see that plan nearing completion when he appeared with, along with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. Earlier we read from our Matthew account of the Transfiguration, but it's also recorded in a few of the other Gospels as well. In the Lucan account, he actually tells us what they were talking about. In Luke, we read that Jesus and Moses and Elijah were speaking of Jesus' departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Did you know that the Greek word used there in Luke for departure is the word exodus? That's no accident. You can't make this stuff up. On the Mount of Transfiguration, that was not the first time that Jesus had ever met with Moses on a mountain to talk about an exodus. But it was the more important exodus. Because there they were talking about Jesus' exodus from the world on behalf of the world's sins and for our salvation. Now that's a plan that was really coming together. What a deliverance we have. What a savior we have. We stand on holy ground. Not only does the Lord know us and call us, not only does he plan for us and send his son to deliver us, he also hears us and empowers you. When my wife and I first got married, we lived in this tiny little apartment in Eau Claire, Wisconsin when I was in seminary. It was 400 square feet. <laughs> so we soon discovered that there was nowhere that you could go in the house that you couldn't still carry on a conversation without raising the tone of your voice. <laughs> so when we moved here, we kind of had to get used to what it was like to relearn how to have a conversation and listen to one another across a bigger house. Well, that's a limitation of human beings, isn't it? When we distance ourselves from each other, we have a hard time hearing each other. Even today with our technology and our phones, we can't always be attentive to our loved ones like we'd like to be. But God can be, and he is. In 1 John 5, we read that we know that God hears us in whatever, wherever we ask. He certainly heard the prayers of Israel as he told Moses, Behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. And I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. The Lord hears. The Lord is ready and eager to hear your prayers. To hear the prayers and the calling of his children, his beloved ones. We sing in that beloved hymn, Do you have trials and temptations? Take them to the Lord in prayer. He's listening. Are you discouraged or depressed? Take it to the Lord in prayer. He's listening. You cannot find a friend more faithful than Jesus. He knows your every weakness. He's listening, and he's ready to answer with his empowering word.
throughout this sermon, we've been referring to God as the I am God, which is the name that he gives himself here in this text. Because when Moses asked God who he should say it was that sent him to the people, God told him, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Who is the I am God? He's the only one there is. There is none else. All the other false gods are not. They're fake. They don't exist. Only the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, only he truly is. He is the I am God. It also has to do with his eternal covenant, the fact that he is faithful. In Psalm 105, verse 8, we read, The Lord remembers his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. He kept his covenant, and he made long ago to Abraham, he kept his covenant to bring the people into the promised land of Canaan. He kept his covenant to deliver all of us once and for all through the precious blood of Jesus. You better believe he's going to keep his covenant to deliver you in the day of trouble when you call upon him and then glorify him. And he will absolutely keep his covenant to deliver you to your eternal home on the last day. And it is this message, this covenant, that empowers us to be his children, that empowers us to come here, that empowers us to spread his word to our loved ones. So what happened to Moses? Did he stay up there on Horeb the rest of his days? Nope, he had work to do, didn't he? What about Jesus? Did he stay up there on the Mount of Transfiguration? Did he allow Peter to build those three tents or tabernacles that he said he was going to? No, of course not. Jesus, too, had work to do. And so as we leave God's house this morning, we, stu we too have work to do. The Lord has known you and called you. He has planned for you and delivered you. He has heard you, and he will empower you and continue to hear you. So may each of us in every act aspect of our lives be about the holy work of glorifying our holy God in all that we think and say and do. And may our great I am God continue to bless each and every one of you with the assurance that your eternal future rests on the holy ground of his holy word and his message of Christ for you and in you. Amen.